Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to speak about the durability of cementitious materials and how we can use thermodynamic modeling to understand better what's going on. Thermodynamic modeling enables us basically to predict based on the mineral logical composition of the starting materials, which hydrates will form and how much of it. And we can apply the same thing also to durability issues. And all the prediction are based on thermodynamic data, which are basically generic data, which means we can measure the solubility of gypsum in a beaker of water at the same solubility. We can also apply it to our cementitious systems. I want to speak about carbonation, chloride, and alkali silica reaction product. And we might just start with carbonation. Here we have to predict the composition of a hydrated cement in the absence and the presence of different amount of CO2. And if we look first on the picture in the absence of any CO2, we predict not unexpectedly the presence of high calcium CSH, of ettringite, of Portlandite, a minor amount of AFM phases and hydrotalcite, and also a little bit of calcite because the original cement also contained some limestone. If we now look on the effect of adding CO2, or basically exposing it to atmosphere with, with the atmospheric CO2 composition, we predict the destabilization of Portlandite to, to calcium carbonate, followed by the decalcification from CSH, from high calcium to low calcium CSH. We also predict the decomposition of ettringite to gypsum, silica, gale, and aluminium hydroxide, as well somewhere in between a destabilization of the AFM phases monocarbonate to stratlingite. However, we do not only change the composition of the solid phase, we also calculate to decrease the pH, and which is shown here in the black line, as well as to decalcify the CSH given here in, in the gray line until we end up at the, to, at the low calcium to silica CSH, and later this will be destabilized to silica. If we now change to the experimental data, this is a phenophthalene sprayed upon the surface of carbonated specimens. We have on the left-hand side the Portlandite cement, we have a Portlandite limestone cement and different Portland cement limestone with um, a metacholine mixes. What we can see is that we have a very small carbonation in the case of Portland cement, as we can see here, basically on the color change to, to colorless, much more in the limestone sample and somewhat more in the metal choline containing samples. We can see also, we can measure TGA on, on, on slides of this carbonated cement. And we can see if we start in the center, not carbonated part, we have a lot of Portlandite. We also see ettringite and CSH as a broad hump. If we go nearer to the surface, we see a decrease of Portlandite here down to the black line and the formation of additional calcium carbonate. We also see a decrease in the amount of AFT and AFM phases and possibly of CSH. The picture is basically similar for our metacholine containing samples, except that we start with much less Portlandite in the beginning. And, but again, we see the decrease of Portlandite, the formation of calcium carbonate, the destabilization of ettringite and AFM phases. We can compare the progress of carbonation as a function of time. Again, we see that the Portland cement has a relatively slow progress, while the cement just blended with 32% of limestone has the fastest, and the metacholine samples are also relatively fast, but a bit slower than the calcium carbonate samples. There are two main effects, as we know from literature, it's the amount of calcium oxide available to be carbonated, and second effect is the porosity. 
if we start now first with the porosity, we can see that the limestone sample here with L has the biggest pores, the highest total porosity, as well as the biggest pore parameter, while the Portland cement sample has somewhat less porosity and also smaller pore size. The metacarline sample have an even smaller pore size and less total porosity. So we think that's one of the main reasons why we have this somewhat slower progress of carbonation we've seen for the metacarline containing samples. When we now compare the composition of the or the changes caused by the carbonation of the two samples. Here we have again the Portland cement. We can see that we carbonate until we reach a theoretical amount of CO2 of 45 grams per 100 grams of cement. If we do the same kind of calculation for the PC metacarline on limestone blend, we can see we can only up, add up to 28 grams CO2 per 100 gram of cement basically meaning that uh, the blended cements have a much lower CO2 binding capacity. And that's the second reason why they carbonate much faster, because they cannot bind so much CO2 when it comes in. And we can nicely use uh, thermodynamic modeling to understand the differences and to calculate how much calcium oxide we have available. We also can basically compare the calculated calcium to silica ratio of the CSH for the four cases. We can see here, again, we can add more, um, more CO2 in the presence of Portlandite than we can do for the metacarline and metacarline limestone cement, or we can plot here the pH. And again, we can we basically realize we can add much more CO2 or bind much more CO2 before we observe the drastic drop of pH, which is indicated by the phenophthalein test. I mainly concentrate now on the solid phases, but we also have a liquid phase. It's not straightforward to gain this liquid phase because we cannot press out carbonated cement because normally we also dry at the same time. So my colleagues at NTNU developed the cold water extraction method where they basically grind the samples, put it into water, let it equilibrate and filtrate, and then measure the composition of the filtrate to learn about the pore solution composition. If we again now start with the solid phase here is in blue is the pH change indicated by Timelftalein indicated this time. In pink is the decrease of Portlandite near the surface and in dark pink is the formation of calcium carbonate near the surface. If we compare that now to the cold water extraction, we can see here in red and orange the total potassium and sodium concentration measured, and in green and blue the, the sodium and calcium carbonate, the potassium and sodium concentration in the carbonated sample. And we see a strong decrease of sodium and potassium upon carbonation. We if we look on the solid phase, we see a similar picture as before CSH, Edwin Guide, Silicious Hydrogon, a decrease of Portlandite formation of calcite, maybe formation of uh, amorphous silica, gypsum, and MSH, and also the, the decalcification of CSH and the decrease of pH. And if we look here in the sodium potassium in the solid, we can see an increase of sodium and potassium bound in the solid. If we look on the liquid calculated liquid phase, this calculated increase of bound pot sodium and potassium is translated in a slower in a lower concentration of alkalis in the pore solution. And the other thing we see, we have an increase of, of sulfate in the pore solution. 
Now, again, I want to compare it to the measured data, and we can see here this decrease we predict for potassium and sodium agrees with the decrease we have observed in the cold water extraction method, indicating that we are able to at least to follow some of the, some of the things we have seen experimentally. We also have seen in the cold water extraction an increase of sulfate concentration here from the not carbonated to the carbonated sample. And if we now ask ourselves what does it mean in terms of corrosion, we calculated or we can have a look on the chloride to hydroxide ratios and the sulfate to hydroxide ratios because they greatly affect the carbonation rate. And we can see that they increase here in red and green, that they increase roughly by a factor of 100 from the uncarbonated to the carbonated samples. This gives us an indication that corrosion will be much more likely in the carbonated samples. If we conclude what we've seen on this carbonation part, we can see different experimental methods give comparable results. The effect of carbonation on pore solution, it decreases pH, it decreases sodium and potassium, it increases sulfate, and I think there's still a lot of things we need to do to, to be done in that aspect. Carbonation increases the risk of corrosion, in particular as it increases the chloride to hydroxide ratio. The second example is the effect of sodium chloride and seawater on hydrated cements. And here, this is measured chloride ingress from after, 20, after three weeks, uh, three months, and half a year. And we can see with time, we have a higher and higher ingress of chloride in the sample. And there's some difference between seawater and sodium chloride. We used a simple modeling approach. We first calculated the composition of the hydrates, and then we mimic the sodium chloride ingression by equilibrating our hydrated cement to different amounts of sodium chloride solution, basically with an idea that uh, a piece of cement in the middle sees only very little of this sodium chloride solution, while a piece sitting here on the surface will see a lot of this sodium chloride solution. If we do that, we get a picture like that. Basically, here on the right-hand side is the hydrated cement, which sees no or very little sodium chloride. And to the left side, we start to see more and more sodium chloride solution. Similar to the carbonation, we predict uh, leaching near to the surface. We predict uh, destabilization of Portlandite and of CSH. And in addition, we predict the destabilization of monocarbonate to friedel salt. And friedel salt is also the place or the solid or the hydrate which binds chloride. And if we compare here the rate percent of chloride in the sample calculated with the measured rate percent, we can see we have a similar behavior. We see this uh, increase towards the center and then way near to the surface, we actually even predict a complete leaching of that. The values itself do not completely agree because we only calculate friedel salt, but in addition, we also have pound chloride in CSH, which will contribute on the measured experimental data. If we compare it now with elemental mapping, we can see a very similar uh, behavior, we can see sulfate leaching near the surface. We also can see the calcium leaching, which we both have predicted by thermodynamic modeling. And we can see an accumulation of sodium near the surface, which is related probably to the increased uptake of alkalis on the CSH, as well as on the possible formation of zeolitic precursors, which also bind alkalis. If we go to seawater, the things get much more complicated because seawater contains not only sodium chloride, it also contains significant amounts of sulfate and magnesium and carbonates. And this we can see here on the schematic picture developed by Jakobsen et al, where they've seen a sequence first of chloride accumulation at the center of the samples, then a sulfate attack, followed by an accumulation of magnesium. 
and we can see this magnesium accumulation also in elemental plots as shown here where we start to see a clear a, a clear formation of a magnesium silicate layer we can do modeling again and it looks similar as we've seen before we we have the unhydrated sample here if we equilibrate it with more and more seawater, we first predict the fetal salt formation in agreement with the observation plotted here. Then we predict the formation of more ettringite. And in the outermost layer, we predict the formation of MSH as well as of porcite and calcite. And if we now compare it to our chloride ingression measurements, we can see again, we predict the formation of uh, chloride in fetal salt. As discussed before, it's not only fetal salt, but also CSH, possibly some other phases which bound it. And we see a clear decrease, basically because we start to form the other phases like uh, etringite and eventually monosulfate, uh, MSH. And Again, already, as already said before, the, the changes predicted by thermodynamic modeling agree quantitatively very well with the changes observed in seawater exposed samples. So to conclude this part, simple thermodynamic modeling can predict the sequence of phases, elemental profiles, and the chloride binding on fetal salt. Maybe just as a word of caution, if we do thermodynamic modeling, we generally predict only the chloride bound in fetal salt. We do not predict the chloride present in CSH, mainly because we don't have thermodynamic models for that yet. While when we do measurement, for instance, elemental mapping, we normally include the chloride in CSH also in the, in the data. We, we see it as part of the solid because we we filtrate or we take away the aqueous solution. If we look at transport, then the chloride in the CSH is what a part of the chloride that can be easily transported. And then we have to look a little bit different on things. I now come to the last of my topics. It's Alkali silica reaction. Alkali silica reaction occurs in concrete, mainly due to the reaction of the silica with high alkalis from the pore solution and the calcium, it leads to cracking and expansion. And we also can, we can see then the formation of this ASR product within the aggregate. It can be crystalline or amorphous. I have shown here an example of a crystalline sample, which has been pictured by one of my colleagues. If we look at it as a function of distance, we see different hydrates formed. We see a crystalline one, we see some amorphous. And if we go out from the aggregate to the cement paste, we also start to see that it intermixes with the CSH. There's a number of open questions. One of it is they are difficult to study because they are so small in size. We didn't have thermodynamic data until very recently. There's a lot of question on expansion mechanism. And also, while we know some mitigation methods, we don't always understand why they work and why they don't work in other cases. So one of the things we did, we synthesized ASR products in batch experiments to be able to study them. We've learned that we can produce some crystalline phases, for instance, schlickerite at 80 degrees. And depending on the availability of potassium and sodium and calcium, we might also form some amorphous ASR products. If we look on the crystalline ASR products, they have a sheet-like structure. There's a, a silica wings which are connected to potassium and calcium, and there's an interlayer region where there might also be some water or other ions. And they give typical signals in the silica NMR, as you can see here. We can see a structured signal for the schlickerite and the more broad signal for the amorphous silica uh, ASR product. And the signals are clearly different to the CSH. 
We can look on the morphology and depending on the presence of sodium and potassium, they can have quite a similar morphology as the one we observe in concrete or in the absence of um, sodium, they also can have a somewhat different morphology. We can, we also have measured aqueous solution. We have known or measured the composition of the solids and based on that we were able to derive thermodynamic data. Maybe we just concentrate here on the sodium example. If we calculate what happens in the absence of calcium, we predict a more silica and we only start to predict the formation of sodium schlicovite if we have some calcium present in the samples, if we start to go to more, more calcium rich samples, then we start to predict the formation of CSH, which actually agrees well with the experimental data. The potassium samples are a bit more complicated because we have two ASR products, the Schlickerweite and the ASRP1, which is the amorphous one. But again, we see the same sequence. We also can now compare these calculations with what we've seen experimentally. Again, we have here plotted the calcium to silica ratio in the experiments. We have here plotted the mass of ASL product which might form. And we can see we have a sequence from ASR product to CSH which corresponds to the experiment, what we've seen in aggregate. We have here a crystalline ASR product. We might form an amorphous and eventually we have CSH. If we add aluminum or fly ash to such a, a concrete, we normally see a much lower expansion as a function of time as shown here, control and in red the effect of fly ash or on this example, the effect of aluminium oxide, which even is able to completely suppress the expansion. Now the question is why? One of the reasons is that we know that aluminium slows down the dissolution of the aggregate, so we have a slower reaction. But this doesn't explain why we have a complete suppression. Then naturally there's the question, will aluminium affect the hydrate front? We did some experiments. Again, you can see a clear difference. If we have no aluminium, we form schlickerite. If we have aluminium, we have a different morphology. We also can look on the NMR data, on the solid state NMR data. We can see that the schlickerite we see here gets destabilized at high aluminium to silica ratio, indicating we form another solid. And if we look on aluminium NMR, we actually start to see that we not, do not only have aluminium hydroxide, but that we start to form something which I call here zeolitic precursor or Nash scale. Basically, that we have something that has aluminium in fourfold coordination. If we now do thermodynamic modeling, also including zeolites in our database, that's exactly what we predict. We predict the formation of philipsite, that's a, a, a zeolite with a 3D structure, and we predict a decrease of the amount of the ASR product and the increase of CSH. So basically to conclude, durability is a complex process. Thermodynamic models can help to understand and visualize the processes. If we speak about carbonation, we can see that the cal free calcium oxide and the porosity is a very important parameters. Poor solution, it's not only the pH that decreases, but also sodium and potassium concentration while sulfate increases. Chloride, we observed leaching at the surface and that there's a big difference between seawater and sodium chloride. ASR, there's their place, the availability of calcium plays an important role, and also the concentration, the aluminium, availability of aluminium plays an important role, as this can prevent the formation of ASR products while what are some NASH or zeolitic precursors are formed. I thank you for your attention and will be happy to answer any question.